And at this time, we are delighted to um, introduce our keynote speaker. Welcome back. Um, and I will now hand over to Dr. Richard Scordum, the co-director of Rice 360 and Malcolm Gillis, University Professor of Bioengineering, who will introduce our keynote speaker and present the 2022 Rice 360 Innovation and Leadership in Global Health Award. Dr. Richard Scordum, over to you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And first, let me just add my congratulations to the student teams who we heard from earlier. Really just extraordinary work. And we're so excited to see the future of your projects and what you accomplished as you move into your professional careers. But now it is my pleasure to give a very special introduction to someone who I am really just truly inspired by, Dr. Ann Hansen. She is a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and also the medical director of the neonatal intensive care unit at Boston Children's Hospital. And she is both an acclaimed teacher and researcher. She has won a number of teaching awards, including Tutor of the Year Award at Harvard Medical School. Since 2010, she has worked with the Rwandan Ministry of Health and Partners in Health to develop and implement national standards for newborn care in Rwanda. And nurses and doctors from all over Rwandan hospitals are taught using these standards. And she's working to make these protocols freely available as videos taught by Rwandan pediatricians and nurses all around the world. Her research focuses on improving the care of seriously ill newborns on global health and medical device development. She's been working with the Rwandan Ministry of Health, Partners in Health and Berkeley National Lab to develop a really ingenious, simple, uh, reusable infant warmer that has gone through successful testing and scale in Rwanda, and she's now working to scale it globally. All of us at Rice360 really admire Dr. Hansen's leadership in newborn health initiatives, and we are truly honored to present her today with the 2022 Rice360 Innovation and Leadership Award. Each year, we give this award to an individual who best exemplifies the dedication of our Institute to Innovation for Global Health. And I know you're going to agree as you hear her speak that Dr. Hansen is a true physician innovator and global health visionary. She really embodies the qualities that we want to see in our students as future global health innovators. So Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for joining us today and over to you for your keynote address. Thank you so much for that incredibly moving introduction. I can't tell you how much it means to be with you today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Sorry. All right, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about bringing warmth to the world's poorest newborns to prevent and treat neonatal hypothermia. And just to clarify, in case there's any doubt, the title, When Global Warming is the Goal, does not refer to global warming from carbon emissions. It's just a play on words about my goal to warm up hypothermic newborns from around the world. Um, I do wanna dedicate this talk to Dr. Paul Farmer. I hope that many of you um, are aware of who he is and the fact that he died very suddenly a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was the founder of Partners in Health, which is the organization through which I have done almost all of my work. And his life was completely dedicated to a fight for social justice and health equity. And I think everybody who is involved in Partners in Health has recommitted to um, carrying out his goals for the rest of our careers. So I just wanna take a minute to acknowledge that. All right, so um, we, I thought it'd be fun to start with some real audience participation and a little pop quiz to get everybody involved in this. Um, since I'm talking to doctors and not engineers, 
um, I think it'd be fun to get started with a little bit of your own medical knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna do a little vote here. And if you could all take out your phones and send in the text to line, the numbers 37607. And then in the message line, write BCH newborn 432. And it's not case sensitive. And I'll tell you that um, you don't need to have gone to medical school to know that we assess a patient's essential bodily functions by measuring four vital signs, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. And so first I want everybody to type into, I'm sorry, so we're gonna get started with um, temperature. And I'm just gonna get out of this one second and get into a poll. All right, so I'd like everybody to type what they think is a normal temperature and we'll use degrees Fahrenheit because that's probably what people are most used to. Everybody go ahead and throw in what you think is a normal temperature. I'll give people five more seconds. This is something you probably learned in grammar school. All righty, so now, yeah. all right, now I'd like you to tell me what you think is a normal heart rate in beats per minute. Range is fine, a single number, whatever you'd like to do. I think it will go to what I want to do. All righty. And now one more pop quiz question. Yeah. Let me know what you think is a normal respiratory rate in breaths per minute. And again, a range is fine or whatever you like. All righty, give you guys a couple more seconds. Okay. All right. Thank you all for that. A little early in the morning for a pop quiz, but I appreciate everyone's participation. I'm going to go back to my slides. Okay. So I think what I learned from that is that all of you know what a normal temperature is within about a tenth of a degree. And we all learn when we're pretty young that human beings are supposed to be 98.6 degrees or 98 degrees or not much more than 99 degrees. And um, 
for heart rate and respiratory rate, what's clear from your answers is that there's expected to be a range. And also for any pediatricians or neonatologists in the audience, you might've thought it was an unfair question because it depends on how old you are. And there's expected to be a range in the other vital signs. And so um, I think that the take home message here is that our bodies regulate the vital sign of temperature within a very narrow range. Or another way of thinking about this is that temperature um, has to be in, a, in about 98.6. And if it's outside of this range as a vital sign, we're in an unhealthy state. Um, I'm gonna give you a different screen to share. One second. Yeah, so you can see your notes. I can oh. see them still. No, but I can see them on my screen. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now open it. Good. Perfect. Now they won't be listening. But now I can't see my notes either. Did you press that up? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, you guys. So um, as you can see, adults can easily maintain a normal core temperature of 98.6, despite large fluctuations in ambient temperature. This happy skier can stay on the slopes all day without becoming hypothermic. But babies, especially those who are small or preterm, cool towards the temperature of their environment. So they need an external heat source to avoid becoming hypothermic, even in really hot environments like Sub-Saharan Africa. When babies are born preterm, they are living outside of the uterus during a critical period of brain development. In these MRI images, you can see the growth in both size and complexity that's programmed to occur during the final 10 weeks of pregnancy. To achieve their biological potential, the brain growth of these babies shouldn't be altered just because they've been born early. If this brain does not grow during this 28 to 38 week window, it can't just do that growth at another time. So it's critical that babies have enough calories to avoid stunting their brain growth. Unlike adults who can easily increase their caloric intake by just eating a bigger lunch from the ski resort cafeteria, it's really challenging to get adequate calories into a preterm baby. That's because of immaturity of a variety of organs, including their intestine, and also limited maternal milk supply. Babies are um, if babies are not in what we call a thermoneutral environment, they have to steal calories that should be used for growth and divert them instead to trying to stay warm. Sometimes they succeed, and the only cost is this poor growth, including brain growth that I just mentioned. But sometimes they develop mild to moderate hypothermia, which impairs many bodily functions, including heart, lung, and immune system. And sometimes they develop really severe hypothermia that can be fatal. In fact, it's estimated that hypothermia contributes to about 40% of the 2.5 million neonatal deaths that occur in each year, almost exclusively in low and middle income countries. So to put a little bit of perspective on that statistic, that's about 587 deaths during the half hour talk that I'm giving you. So we need to start thinking about the provision of heat to preterm babies, the way we think about the provision of oxygen to patients with pneumonia. It needs to be continuous to provide the best outcome. Babies in the United States very rarely develop hypothermia, and that's because they're provided with a continuous heat chain from the delivery room through transport to an appropriate intensive care unit, and then for the duration of their hospitalization, until they develop the body fat and metabolism so that they don't need an external heat source any longer. But electric sources of external heat don't work well in poor settings. They require a constant source of electricity. They're really expensive. They're very difficult to use and babies can become either hypo or hyperthermic, both of which are really unhealthy. They're surprisingly difficult to clean and so there's a risk of transmitting hospital acquired infections. And they're also really difficult to maintain. And sometimes with the first power surge, these pieces of equipment that can cost thousands of dollars instantly become a very poor investment. So it's really challenging to prevent hypothermia without an electric source of external heat. 
And that's why neonatal hypothermia is essentially only a problem in poor settings. And whenever a medical condition is skewed by income like this, the only, potent, the only possible explanation is that it's preventable with enough resources. So the gold standard for thermoregulation in low and middle income countries is skin to skin contact, also called kangaroo mother care, where babies are placed directly on their mother's chest. And here you can see a proud mother providing skin to skin warmth. And this works really well. It has a lot of additional advantages like improving bonding and lactation and providing a shared microbiome between the mother and the baby. But it's a problem when it does not provide enough heat or if the mother needs to attend to activities that aren't compatible with KMC, like cooking over a fire or bathing. And also if doctors and nurses need to access the baby to provide assessments or treatments, they often put the baby directly on a non-warmed surface like a bed, as you can see in this photograph where a baby is receiving a physical exam. So we urgently need a complement to skin to skin to support mothers through the weeks or even months when their babies need external heat. Um, as we think about ways to minimize heat loss, it's helpful to remember the four ways that we lose heat to a colder environment. There's convection, which is heat loss to colder air currents, radiation, which is heat loss to a colder surface that's nearby, evaporation, which is heat loss through moisture evaporating, and then conduction, which is heat loss by direct transfer to colder surfaces. And you can see how these modes of heat loss are relevant to the ways we think about improving thermoregulation, such as increasing ambient air temperature, drying the newborn, avoiding drafts, closing windows, covering the newborn with insulators, such as a plastic bag, a warm blanket, or a hat, and placing the infant in direct contact with a warmer surface. So we already talked about skin to skin, which is the most effective and um, appropriate way, but also there's the idea of a trans warmer mattress, which is a mattress that provides an external heat source through conduction. So now you know enough background to understand how this story started for me. Um, as Dr. Richards Cordon mentioned, more than a decade ago, I started working with Partners in Health, along with the Rwanda Ministry of Health, uh, to improve newborn survival in Rwanda. And I was just shocked by how difficult it was to keep these babies warm. I'd been working with sick newborns for over 20 years in Boston, and I'd honestly never given thermoregulation a second thought. No matter how small the baby, our nurses just popped them into an incubator and that was that. But in this photograph, you can see the kind of makeshift solutions we had to resort to in Rwanda, putting a baby in a wash basin filled with medical gloves that had hot water in them, which can easily cause severe burns. Um, so I kept on thinking, if we can put a man on the moon, we just have to be able to keep these babies warm. The condition of neonatal hypothermia sorely needed what's called a frugal technology which is an appropriate device that's designed for the setting in which it's needed, where there may not be electricity, the healthcare staff may have limited training and experience, and likely no one will know how to maintain or repair the device. So that's where engineers enter the picture. I looked at every available option for external heat sources that were designed for low resource settings, and the most appealing ones were these transformer mattresses, but they all had major drawbacks like this one, which uh, requires a system of fabrics that can really be used only for a single patient in a setting without diapers or clothes washers, which is where I was working. And since I couldn't find anything that could work well in the setting where I was practicing, I started collaborating with engineers at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, basically trying to make a soft skin temperature surface that was not dependent on electricity, that was extremely safe, intuitive to prepare, use, and clean with minimal training, and was reusable and affordable. And so is born the Dream Warmer. It's made of 37 degree phase change wax, accompanied by a 40 degree phase change temperature indicator. Here's how it works. You heat water to boiling. You put the mattress in a wide base thermos rolled up. 
you fill the thermos with the boiled water, screw on the top, and wait around half an hour. And then when you remove the thermos, it's in a liquid state. You put it in an insulating sleeve and wait until the 40 degree phase change um, thermal indicator shows that it's cool to 40 degrees, which can take around 10 or 15 minutes, and then it's ready for use. It can be used either as a additional warmth while a mother is doing kangaroo mother care, as you can see in this drawing, or it can be a source of standalone heat when the mother is not available for KMC. It can be used in the hospital or health center setting, on neonatal or labor and delivery wards, on transport, either from home to a hospital, within hospitals, or to a higher level of care. And it could also be used in the home setting, either for home deliveries or for mothers who are discharged to home, still needing to do KMC. So in terms of some challenges for engineers, one of the challenges was what weight of wax is needed to be able to maintain warmth for about six hours. What is the minimum volume of water needed to melt all of the wax? And this is taking into account the highest altitude hey, where water would boil at a lower temperature and also the lowest ambient temperatures where the mattress itself would start at a lower temperature. We needed to find the right materials that were non-toxic, low cost, and the phase change wax at 37 and 40 degrees, learn how to inject the wax into the mattress, which turns out to be challenging, and then design the mattress to meet user requirements, like making sure that's the width and the length of a baby, engineering requirements, like making sure it has the heat capacity, heat transfer, service to volume ratio, and that the mattress itself is easily foldable to fit in the thermos, and then to keep within a variety of cost and reliability constraints. Our final product satisfies the PATH qualifications for thermoregulation devices with two exceptions. Um, it does not prevent dropping and falling, and it also does not provide instant heat generation. It needs to be prepared in advance to be ready for a hypothermic baby. One thing that I was not aware of that it does do very nicely is fit into this zero separation campaign, which um, is trying to keep mothers and babies together at all times. And so often when a baby is put in an incubator or on a warming table, they're brought to a different part of a neonatal ward and it's more difficult for the mother to be present. Whereas with the infant warmer, it goes right on the bed. And so the mother can be right there with her baby to breastfeed and for them to be close at all times. So now we're gonna sort of fast forward through seven painstaking years of designing studies with biostatisticians, applying for IRB approvals, reassuring ministries of health, begging plastic manufacturers, hiring and training Rwandan study nurses and study managers. We were able to conduct two pilot studies in which the warmer was used a total of 204 times in rural Rwandan hospitals and health centers. We found only a 3.4% of cases of mild hyperthermia, which you can see here, just a couple of cases, but otherwise zero adverse events such as rashes or burns. And um, the warmer was highly effective with a 97% case of infants achieving euthermia if they started out being hypothermic, and then 100% of babies staying euthermic if they were at risk of hypothermia on the basis of being low birth weight and mother not available for KMC. Based on this success, we conducted a cluster randomized stepped wedge study, which is a very complex design. And I'll tell you for all of these studies, I'm gonna kind of zip through with the results just because of time restraints. But in the Q&A at the end, if people have more questions, I'm happy to go into more detail. In this particular study, we enrolled patients in 10 hospitals and we started with a two week observation period, brought in a new hospital every two weeks, and then had a four week observation period once the warmer was introduced everywhere. We collected a series of pre data and post data and co um, compared health co outcomes before and after. The entire study lasted 26 weeks. I will tell you that it occurred in the middle of COVID. And the whole study was shut down for about two months. And I thought the whole thing was going to um, be impossible to restart. But the Rwandan Ministry of Health picked it as one of its very first uh, studies to resume, 
which I think really speaks to the importance of the study for the country and the um, power of our close collaboration with the ministry. Um, you can see that babies use the warmer as few as one time and as often as 21 times with a lot of variability in between. And um, we measured whether babies uh, were euthermic, hypothermic, or hyperthermic. And what you can see is if you look at the time when the warmer was before the warmer was introduced compared to after, rates of euthermia rose from 51 to 67%. Just in specific cases that the warmer was or wasn't used, rates of euthermia when not used were rose from 59 to 79%. And then very interestingly, remembering back to our pilot studies where we had that 3.4% rate of hyperthermia, very surprisingly, we found out that across the board, 12% of babies were hyperthermic. And surprisingly, rates of hyperthermia were lower at 10% when the warmer was used compared to 12% when it was not used. So back to our earlier poll of normal temperatures, babies not only have trouble keeping their temperature out of hypothermia range, they also have trouble keeping it out of a hyperthermic range. So just in general, their thermal regulation is less tight. And this was new information, uh, certainly for me. Um, and here again, you can see um, this is the lowest temperature for babies before they were on the warmer, and then their temperature on the warmer. And this is a normal range, 36 to 37.5. Again, with these couple of patients being in the hyperthermic range, but this is actually better than babies who did not use the warmer. The other thing that we found that I just wanna make very clear was definitely not due exclusively to warmer use is that the rates of mortality fell dramatically for patients who ever used the warmer even once. So in the case where the warmer was never used, the mortality rate was 2.8%. And in the case where the warmer was used at least once, the mortality rate was only 0.9%, which was highly statistically significant. I do not wanna make the claim that this is because of the warmer because that's not possible. I think it's probably something related to having been involved in a study and the extra care that they got just in general helped to reduce their mortality, but this was certainly exciting for us to see. And we were also thrilled that the study was able to be published in The Lancet and was nominated for the Society of Clinical Trials 2021 Trial of the Year. So putting together our three studies of the infant warmer in a little meta-analysis, you can see that um, the rates of hypothermia uh, for babies who used the warmer, excuse me, for babies who used the warmer because they were hypothermic, 89% of them became euthermic. For babies who used the warmer because they were at risk of being hypothermic and KMC was not available, 99% stayed warm. And putting all of that together, our rates of euthermia with warmer use is 92%, which compared to the pretty much ubiquitous occurrence of hypothermia in settings where there's not a warmer and there's not adequate other external heat sources, this 92% is something we're really proud of. And then just again, this quick reminder that rates of hyperthermia were lower with use of the warmer than without. Our next steps is that we wanna conduct some kind of a phase four clinical trial to assess the human factors and uptake and unforeseen benefits and barriers when used outside of a strict research protocol. Because right now most hospitals have no thermoregulatory option, we wanna make sure that nurses don't find this preparation use and cleaning overly burdensome and end up not using it. And um, really wanna make sure it doesn't just sit on a shelf. So we wanna find out um, how it's used when not part of research and just uh, learn a little bit about ways that we could optimize our education and perhaps any final design changes to make sure that it's really used and enjoyed by the nurses and mothers. Um, and to get a little bit better understanding of how it interacts with KMC and breastfeeding and overall well-being and morale of both nurses and moms of preterm babies. And then in terms of implementation, <clears throat> our goal is to scale, scale the dream warmer throughout Rwanda and then really beyond Rwanda to the rest of the world. Um, so towards that second goal, 
Um, we've established a Boston Children's Hospital Partners in Health novel maternal and neonatal consortium that involves Rwanda, but also Malawi, and Lesotho, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Haiti, Mexico, and Peru. These are all the sites where Partners in Health has on the ground maternal and neonatal services. And because these are eight different sites with Boston Children's Hospital and Partners in Health, we're 10 entities in all. And so we are called 10 for 2030. And um, we have made a one decade commitment to work together to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals for newborns, which is less than or equal to 12 neonatal deaths per thousand live births. Um, here you can see the Rwandan team as part of this 10 for 2030 consortium. And our goals in this consortium are to develop and make sure to supply all essential medications and medical devices and medical education based on those Rwandan national neonatal protocols that Dr. Richards Cordon mentioned that I helped the Rwandans to write and are now out in their third edition, including this um, open pediatric curriculum, which is a free web-based video platform that has all of the protocols taught by Rwandan pediatricians and nurses. Um, we've also developed and are populating a database with dashboard of quality indicators so that the teams can find out where they're doing well and celebrate their successes as well as where they're not doing quite as well and try to solve challenges and share frustrations together. And here you can see uh, this was the team in Sierra Leone who made it through the entire open pediatrics curriculum and they're each getting a certificate for having um, completed that. Um, I also decided that this was a little bit beyond the book of business of Boston Children's Hospital to be uh, manufacturing and distributing medical devices. So um, I founded a nonprofit called Global Newborn Solutions, which is intended to bring the dream warmer as our first product to scale um, with the goal of then identifying other um, medical devices or anything else that would be helpful to uh, help newborn survival and improve outcome. Um, we've got our logos and our trademarking all done. We have a website that you're all welcome to check out, globalnewborn.org. We have um, patents that we've exclusively licensed. We think we're at the very tail end of both US and Rwanda FDA approval. And now we're really focusing on a manufacturing partner who we've secured with some final design and processing ongoing to make the warmer very, very durable and as high quality as possible so that once we get it to these very remote locations, it will last for a long time. Just a couple of responsibilities and challenges that I've um, learned about conducting research in low resource settings. It's really, really of great ethical importance to ensure that any study that's conducted in the low resource setting has to be conducted there and can't be conducted in a setting where it's not so burdensome and to really make sure that the whole effect of doing the research there is not a huge burden to a uh, staff that generally is quite overwhelmed with their clinical care. Um, I was amazed by how many IRBs had to be filled out between Boston Children's and Partners in Health in Rwanda, and they often disagreed about what they wanted, and there was a lot of going around and around in circles. Some of these IRBs took almost a year to get um, resolved. Uh, there's surprising difficulty with customs when importing a medical device. Some of these we ended up having to just bring in suitcases. Um, there's a huge responsibility to build capacity of local staff and ensure that they're properly mentored and that they receive appropriate pay and rec recognition and academic credit for their work. And then overall, a requirement that when you look back on what was done, you're sure that you added rather than drained local resources. And then finally, some lessons learned. I would say that having the idea of the dream warmer was by far the easiest part that everything that I've done took much, much longer than I ever could have imagined. The FDA process particularly has been just amazingly slow and certainly COVID did not help. Finding the right manufacturer has been also just shockingly difficult, especially because we're trying to make what for a manufacturer is considered a relatively low volume product with a very small profit margin. And I would just say that the whole process has been a lot like climbing a mountain with a series of false peaks. And I keep on thinking that I'm on the top and then I find out that I'm really just at another false peak. And so I would say for me, having the motivation to keep climbing to the true peak has required a conviction that there's just no choice but to keep moving forward. 
And I also will say that being honored with this RICE 360 Innovation and Leadership in Global Health Award is a huge motivator to keep climbing. Um, I'd like to finish with this slide, which I just um, also find extremely motivating. These are the first two babies to ever, ever go on our dream warmers. This is an early prototype. Um, and I think when people look at a picture like this and they look at these tiny babies, there's sort of a sense that they're just probably not gonna survive no matter what, and that it might just be um, impossible to think that they're gonna make it and do well. But I asked our study nurse, cause I wanted to get consent for these babies pictures, if she would go and find the mother and ask if it was okay to use the pictures and while, we, while she was there, if she could just grab a shot of what the babies looked like now. And so at 15 months, you can see that these babies are really thriving as is their beautiful mother and that these kids are gonna just do great. So I think it's really important to understand that even though babies look small and they look fragile and vulnerable, they absolutely can thrive and do great. They just need a little help from us. So with that, I will say thank you so much. It's really exciting for me to share all of this and I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Hansen, for that inspiring um, talk. What a call to action for this community. We'd love to open up the floor to questions for Dr. Hansen at this time. Dr. Hansen, I see a question from Dr. Brigman in the chat. How does the dream warmer hold enough heat after initial setup? Yes, thank you. Um, so it is very calibrated to be um, an amount of phase change wax, such that the wax itself holds the heat. So just, um, it, it's about a kilogram of wax. And once that entire kilogram is melted, it takes it six hours to refreeze or become solid again. So during that entire time, while it's in the phase change between liquid and solid, um, the wax itself is designed to have that phase change at 37 degrees. It's a little bit of a confusing concept. It's kind of like if you have a glass of ice water and it has water and it has ice, it, by definition, it's going to be at 32 degrees or zero degrees Celsius for the entire time that you have ice and liquid together. So this is the same, except for that it's going from liquid to solid and it's at 37 degrees or 98.6. Can I ask a question? Um, it was really such an amazing um, journey that you described and so many of the challenges that you talked about, I think are very, very real. And we, we really admire the way that you have persisted through those. What do you wish that funding agencies did differently to support innovators through those challenges? Hmm. Wow, that's a great question. I will tell you that the funding has been unbelievably difficult. That like along with the practical things like the FDA and manufacturers, other people may have more success, but I have found the funding so challenging. I think there's very few, relatively speaking, uh, granting agencies who are interested in global health. And so the competition is very extreme. And um, just in general, I think pediatrics is harder to get funded than uh, medicine for grownups. And um, it's been hugely challenging. I will tell you that almost all of my funding has been through philanthropy and not through big funding agencies. Um, I'm not sure if I'm proud of this or not, but I've just found it easier to meet people who can get caught up in the incredibly, to me, motivating idea that keeping babies warm is just a simple thing that we have to be able to do. Um, but I have found funding agencies to be very difficult to crack. So I don't know. I actually have not been very successful there, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, I just think we need way more money to go into this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanson. I see some questions in the chat. A question from Dr. Machen. Um, those happy babies say it all. What an amazing concept and outcome. Is there an increased risk of hypothermia if busy nurses are unable to remove the device at six hours and the baby is on it longer? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so after six hours, what happens is it just becomes 
it, because of the um, pad that they're laying on, it's never dangerous for them to lay on it. It's not like they are suddenly on at risk of any problems, but they just wouldn't be warm anymore. And so it is. it only lasts for six hours. And our intention is only to complement KMC. We're not necessarily trying to have somebody use this warmer 24 hours a day. So in the studies that we've done, mothers have said, you know, in half an hour, I would love to go and bathe and take care of my other children. And then I'm going to be back in three hours. And so usually they've come back well before the warmer has lost heat. Um, but what our intention would be to supply enough warmers so that, for example, if there was a very small baby and the baby really needed the heat in addition to KMC, and so it was needed 24 hours a day, the um, by having two warmers, you can always have one heating up and one being used. Um, but yes, after six hours, they would not, there's no risk. It's just that the, the risk would be the same as lying on that bed that doesn't provide any heat. I also see some solidarity in the chat from every shelter. Thank you for being here, every shelter, on the funding agency comment. Um, I see a question from Dr. Green um, really about the heat source, the input to your system, and comparing sort of cold cultures or high latitudes in your system. Yes, so um, one thing that we have been very happy to find is we've studied it both in places with and without electricity, and we found that even places without electricity don't have any trouble boiling the water. They have coal, they have something. Every human society has figured out how to boil water, so that's not been an issue. But in Rwanda, it's a really high elevation, and so it took people a little while to figure out that obviously, like you're all engineers, you would know that the water is boiling at a much lower temperature when you're up at very high elevation. It just takes longer for that um, dream warmer to melt. And so uh, people just need to, part of our training and education is very much directed at saying, come in in the morning, boil the water, prepare a bunch of warmers, and then go out and do your vital signs. It takes just a couple of minutes, but then you already have them ready to use when you need them. Um, and that's a little bit of advanced planning that's been a little bit tricky for some of the nursing staff, but they get into it pretty quickly. I, I hope that answers the question. If not, please clarify. I guess one other thing I'll just say is that one of the places that we really want to try the warmer next is in Lesotho, which even though it is really in sub-Saharan Africa, it's at very high elevation and they have, it's really cold there. And most places do not have any internal heating and um, there's snow and like, it's like Boston. So um, I'm very curious to know if the warmer actually starts at something like freezing then, and it's at high elevation, will that test the limits of the system from both ends and might they need to boil the water, find out that by the time that it's been in there for half an hour, the water is too cool to melt it and they need to do a second boiling. I'm hoping not, but that will be the biggest challenge. Thank you for sharing that. I hear that uh, heat transfer analysis at the heart of your work. Um, I see a question from Sonia, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anson, for your talk. Um, I, um, I, be, I was a fellow at Rice 360 and now I'm uh, working coordinating clinical studies so I can uh, relate to everything that you shared. I wanted to ask uh, if you have a word for the young engineers and innovators that we have here about the time that it takes to take to carry a technology from um, the problem need all the way to having a, a manufactured product and um, at Rice 360, we have been following uh, your progress, but maybe for someone starting to get into global health, it could be very, very inspiring. And also to have a, a little bit of reality check of how long it takes to um, do this. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. Yeah. I mean, I will share with you, it has been so, so, so long. Sometimes I feel like I'm on an airplane and the airplane's supposed to leave and then People say, oh, you know, just 15 more minutes because we need to refuel and then the airplane's supposed to leave. And then they say, oh, it's going to be another hour because, you know, there's a problem with the luggage and then the airplane's about to leave. And I feel like I've just been doing that over and over and over again, thinking that we're almost done. Um, I will share that my main day job is that I am the medical director of the NICU here at Boston Children's Hospital. So the reason it's taken so long is that I have a full time job. And I'm trying to do this in addition. And I think for many of you who have chosen the wonderful, wonderful line of work to do this full time, it should be faster. Um, but that said, things like the FDA process, I don't know how you can speed that up. Things like finding manufacturers has just been, it's taken us years. 
So this whole thing is now on about year 11. But as I said, I may be naive, but I think we're just about to pick your metaphor, be at the top of the mountain or see this plane leave the tarmac um, because we finally do really have an amazing manufacturing partner. And I really, really think we're at, at very close to the end of the FDA process. But for me, it's, I would just say 10 years of, of continuing to move this forward um, I know there's people who do this faster. There just has to be, otherwise the whole world wouldn't function. Um, but we're trying to keep this extremely affordable. And so also I should just add that everyone's time has been donated. All of the engineers, even the current manufacturer is donating all of their time. And so if we, again, back to the funding question, these all loop together. If we had lots of money and we could pay people you know, high salaries to just go ahead and do this, I think it could be way faster. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen. And what an excellent question from Sonia to end on with that inspiration for the innovators um, represented today. Thank you so much. And to our community present today, please join me in thanking again, Dr. Hansen for her inspiring talk. Thank you so much. And yeah. at this- Thank you so much. It's been so fun. I really look forward to this. I wish you could have done it in person and I could have met all of you, but this means absolutely the world to me. And it's such a pleasure to share it with people who are so like-minded. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen, and we'll eagerly follow the next steps for the Dream Warmer and wish you all the best in your continued work.